Hello and welcome uh, everyone this evening. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous people for millennia. We honour the centuries of Indigenous peoples who have walked on Turtle Island before us. We are grateful for the opportunity to live, work and play in Niagara and we give thanks to the ancestors who have served as stewards of this special place. Good evening and welcome. My name is Deborah Antonsik and I'm the Director Curator of Riverbrink Art Museum in Queenston, Niagara on the Lake. We are very pleased to present this artist talk by Elizabeth Chitty. Elizabeth has been a St. Catharines based artist for many years. Her practice is interdisciplinary and includes performance, installation, film and photography. One of the subjects that has engaged Elizabeth's attention is water, a focus that is an important element of the exhibition Power, which we are hosting at Riverbrink until October 23rd. This exhibition has been supported by a project grant from the Ontario Arts Council and by private donations. I also encourage everyone to visit our website to make a donation and support our activities and programming such as this talk this evening. I'll begin with a brief clip from the exhibition and then I'll turn things over to Elizabeth. Washington questions arising between the United States and Canada. The United States of America and His Majesty the King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and of the British Dominions beyond the seas, Emperor of India, being equally desirous to present his views regarding these boundary waters and to settle all questions which are now pending between the United States and the Dominion of Canada, involving the rights, obligations, or interests of either in relation to the other, or to the inhabitants of the other, along their common frontier, and to make provision for the adjustment and settlement of all such questions as may hereafter arise. I resolve to conclude a treaty in furtherance of these ends, and for that purpose have appointed as the respective plenipotentiaries the President of the United States of America, Elihu Root, Secretary. Okay, I'll let I'll ask Elizabeth to try and share her screen now and begin her presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for the introduction and the land acknowledgement. So uh, Deborah played that short video clip and here's a still photograph also of power, which has three video channels. The, each video channel is different, but highly related and uh, they interact with one another and they are synced. The audio program does run separately. It has four channels. And you can see three of the speakers in this photograph, excuse me. <clears throat> the audio program runs from the editing software I use, which is called Reaper. And the spatialization um, instructions, the, the instructions to the audio for how it moves around the room are in, uh, in Reaper. For those who haven't been in the gallery or on the website uh, to, see the description, uh, I'll just ask if we could have a quick skim over this description. I would also like to acknowledge and thank all those who played a role in the production of Power. The three women who walk in the video, of course, Janice Barlow, Marie Jones, Vicki Lynn Smith. I'll also mention at this time that a number of Mohawk uh, names are gonna come up while I'm talking. I have done some Mohawk language study, but I am really out of practice. And rather than uh, speak poorly, I'm going to not, um, uh, attempt to pronounce the, the Mohawk uh, words. Here, for example, Marie's uh, true name. Uh, the Marsh Bird Monitors, uh, I was fortunate enough to follow them on a trip and their volunteers with Birds Canada and Niagara River RAP, which I'll be speaking about later. And I do my own recording and editing. Matthew Steves, <clears throat> excuse me, was extremely helpful to me in um, guiding me through a number of production issues. 
And uh, Darren Copeland is my audio mentor, really. I've been working with Darren since I think 2002, and I would not be doing the work I do without um, his, uh, his support. I do my own recording, except for the bird recordings, which I download on Creative Commons licenses. And here also, if you would uh, take a quick look at the documents I read from in the audio program. I'd like to mention the first one, the papers of Sir William Johnson, volume four. I read from his letter when he returns from Niagara uh, to Johnson House in um, uh, what we now call Brantford after the negotiation of the treaty. And I do that instead of reading the treaty because the treaty exists as belts, not in a European language, which I think is very distinct and of great interest. William Johnson was married to Molly Brandt, and I think it's um, uh, just stands to reason and should be self-evident that he who was so well known for his ability to negotiate use, using Haudenosaunee protocol, uh, he must have learned so much uh, from, from Molly Brandt, who was such a leader, uh, a Mohawk leader, as well as uh, from, uh, from others, of course. And I'll be speaking uh, later about the report of the International Waterways Commission uh, mentioned here. And I'll just uh, also point out the Great Wa Lakes Water Quality Agreement, because I do talk about the RAP, the Remedial Action Plan, a little bit. And that's a key document. First written in 78, and it goes through uh, various uh, revisions. I'd like to also thank uh, these people who all played a role in some, uh, some way and uh, the donors as well. I did not get funding for my project, complained on Facebook, and these very kind people gave me uh, money, uh, which is uh, so important, arts donors. Now, I've divided this talk into two parts. The first is a kind of wide angle lens, the context, so to speak, and then the second uh, zooms in and speaks about the work more specifically. So I, uh, this is, uh, I grew up in the shadow of the Brock Monument at Queenston, where Riverbrink, Queenston Heights, uh, Riverbrink being just down the road, so to speak. That's the Niagara River in the background. My parents emigrated to uh, St. Catharines from England just two years before I was born. I was born in St. Catharines. And Queenston Heights was a place like many families where we uh, picnicked and visited with relatives. This is my sister and I, I'm holding the brownie camera, sitting, uh, thinking it's very hilarious, sitting on our father who is exhausted from working in the foundry at McKinnon Industries, which later became part of General Motors. Now, I mentioned growing up in the shadow of Sir Isaac Brock because uh, the War of 1812 history is, of course, huge in Niagara, as in some other parts of Canada, and certainly Queenston Heights um, uh, being a, a key part of that. But it wasn't until years and years and years later that, uh, of course, I started to understand how that shadow was cast much longer and more deeply on others. And uh, that is only very recently being remedied with the building of, say, Landscape of Nations, which acknowledges and honors the First Nations allies in the, uh, this battle and the War of 1812. And uh, also in St. Catharines, currently there's the renaming of a park to Richard Pierpoint Park. Uh, Richard Pierpoint being a black settler who um, uh, played a, a key role in the formation of what was called the Colored Corps, even at a very advanced age. And these were histories which were just not part of the dominant narrative. Uh, it's really very recent that uh, they have gained their place. This question is what I call my core question. 
What does it mean to be in a body, a place at this time with others? I think it's possible my entire body of work, uh, which of course spans what, 47 years or something, could be viewed in light of this question, but definitely recent work. And I've acknowledged here that this question was very much inspired by words I read in uh, this book, felt. So we're gonna look at the Niagara Waters body of work. And relating back to that core question, this body of work addresses what does it mean to be in a place? The first work was in 2008 fall, a video and audio installation exhibited at Grimsby Public Art Gallery. And it looked specifically at the waterfalls, which are very, predominant in the North Niagara area on creeks that are numbered. And the following work, 2010, was a performance commissioned by a wonderful chamber music ensemble uh, gallery players of Niagara. And uh, Rose Bolton was the composer who was commissioned. And the distance of their mouths gets their title uh, from, I mentioned that fall was about the, the waterfalls on the numbered creeks and distance of their mouths uh, addressed specifically the actual creeks, uh, layering them with um, uh, personal narrative. And so from the get go, I was fascinated by the naming, by the numbered naming. Uh, distance of their mouths gets their title because uh, all the creeks which go from two mile to 40 mile, that is the number of miles of the mouths of those creeks from the mouth of the Niagara River. And even at this early stage in this body of work, I was fascinated by this numeric naming as a sign or symptom of, um, of colonialization. In 2014, I exhibited Streaming 12, a video and audio installation at the dearly departed uh, Rodman Hall Art Center. Rodman Hall uh, is situated above the bank of 12 Mile Creek. <coughs> Excuse me. It had three video channels, all of which were different, unlike power, uh, not synced in any way. The one you see on the left was of drone footage, drone footage not being as ubiquitous as it now is uh, back when I made this, because, uh, it, well, I said that Rodman Hall was situated uh, over the 12 Mile Creek and the drone flew from the foot of Rodman Hall up to one of the bridges, Glendale Bridge. On the right, there was a camera attached to the roof uh, for the work of Rodman Hall aimed at the tree, uh, the creek, I beg your pardon. And I was going to say that because of the time of exhibition, uh, foliage did in fact affect the uh, ability to see the 12 mile creek, but it was there. And the small video was, I edited together uh, primarily historical, well, entirely, I think, historical photographs and maps related to the building of the Q generating station number two, uh, Rodman Hall being just downtown, uh, downtown downstream from the Q generating station number one and two. And number one is the oldest electric, uh, oldest continually running electric um, uh, generating station in Canada, if not the world. I keep on meaning to uh, check that uh, lately because I have forgotten, <clears throat> excuse me, since the late 1800s. And uh, the Q2 was built when, um, for specifically to increase power production for war industries in World War II. And that's what the photographs in that little video are taken from. You can see in the photograph, there's headphones on the bench. That's for the audio program. Uh, it was a group exhibition called The Source, uh, curated by Stuart Reed and Patrick McMahon. And uh, because it was a group exhibition, the audio needed to play through uh, headphone. Bottom left image, 
I created with my uh, collaborating with my daughter Nell Chitty, and it was done for a poster uh, project associated with the source. And it is, in fact, a shot of the confluence, which I will get to later. At the time, I was quite um, oblivious that I was shooting the the confluence of Twelve Mile Creek and Dix, and it was shot from a bridge, which has since that time been uh, replaced looking down on a even older bridge that still remains. The next work in the series uh, 2015 uh, is Lucius's garden and uh, it was a performance that was in the public domain at the corner of James and King Streets in St. Catharines where there's a funny little fountain that was donated to the city by its first mayor, Lucius Oil. And he was the mayor who oversaw the creation of the very first municipal waterworks. And <clears throat> I didn't mention, um, now why is my button not working? Hmm. Okay, oh, there we go. Uh, with Streaming 12, I, that was when I started to get interested in water infrastructure, uh, specifically with the uh, hydroelectric power and the alteration, the human alteration to waterways, in this case, 12 Mile Creek, because of hydroelectric power generation. I also, this was when I started to get interested in water governance. And that came up strictly out of the fact that Rodman Hall is on land, which at that time was owned by the university and, and the garden descending to the bank. The path, the trail, the walking trail, biking trail is owned by the municipality. Then the bank of the creek and the bottom of the creek is owned by OPG, Ontario Power Generation. I found these layers of uh, ownership and governance quite uh, interesting. So back to this slide, the following work was Confluence Field Trips, which I made uh, reference to. The Confluence being the Confluence of 12 Mile Creek and Dix Creek. Both of those creeks having a lot of history with the early Welland canals and um, Dix Creek being a creek which uh, part of which was buried with the creation of a freeway uh, around very close to that uh, intersection. This work was predicated by the opening of two cultural buildings. Uh, the Brock University of Maryland I Walker School of Fine and Performing Arts where the work was exhibited and the city of St. Catharines First Ontario Performing Arts Center. I was fascinated with both of those uh, buildings overlook what is called Canal Valley. And I was fascinated by the cycles of wilderness, industrialization, abandonment, reclamation that exists in Canal Valley. Um, anyway, I won't get carried away talking about confluence uh, field trips right now. The um, next work was a constructed photograph, which in fact, uh, it was commissioned by the city of Niagara Falls and in fact uninstalled, but it was intended to be in three panels uh, pasted to the uh, wall of the underpass of the bridge that currently crosses the Niagara River uh, at the site of the uh, historical bridge we see in this photograph. I'll mention also that I participate in Radio Apogee Global Sound Map Project, which is based in Belgium. And I have four audio um, clips there that relate to the 12 Mile Creek. And this one, the sound of electricity to Q1 was uh, part of um, Streaming 12's audio program. And I had the great good fortune to be given access to the Q1, the um, very old station. It's so beautiful and incredibly old machinery and like the fonts on the machinery and such, just so wonderful. And I walked from one end to the other. It's quite small, uh, recording the sound of electricity being made. The next three audio clips here are um, part of Power's audio program. 
Now, these works are not about Niagara waters, but are part of the body of work. Uh, Niagara River is, of course, part of the Great Lakes Basin. And the very first work was in 2007, uh, uh, first work in a triptych of photographs called The Guardian of Niagara. Only one of them uh, is related to water. And um, this, uh, that's the image there. So now I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna speak briefly about pre-Confederation treaties in my work. And back to that core question, what does it mean to be in a place with others? So I mentioned that I um, got interested in governance with uh, water governance with Streaming 12 in 2014. Um, uh, well, I'll get back to that point in a moment. The first time I worked with the treaty was 2004. Well, 2002 is when I, I made that section. It was part of a work that has nothing to do with water particularly. It was about, uh, its theme was peace and nonviolence. And the third part, Eskinovich, I made based on what uh, many of us know as the burnt church um, crisis. And uh, sadly, of course, these um, conflicts with, uh, uh, between Mi'kmaq fishers and, and uh, nations and government of Canada, are uh, recently repeated. Anyway, uh, Treaty of Peace and Friendship renewed 1752. This was the first time I used a treaty in my work. And for Streaming 12, I took it up um, specifically about Niagara and I mentioned that it was the beginning of my interest in governance. So of course, uh, uh, to me, it seemed important and uh, a natural thing to include a treaty. And so this was when I started to look into the treaties uh, of Niagara. And I don't remember how I actually came to Nanfan, but uh, I did. And I had the great good fortune to commission a translation from uh, Franklin Miller, a knowledge keeper who actually was very recently honored at uh, Celebration of Nations. Um, Marie Jones introduced me to him and he translated from the English language into Mohawk because I did not want the treaty in the English language. Um, uh, it was played uh, as part of the, uh, the audio. I used that sound source again in Lucius's garden and then in Graciously Pleased, which was a one channel work that I made um, in 2016 as part of the reconciliation activities for the supporters of the Haudenosaunee Right to Height Hunt that I was uh, very involved in. And uh, this was at the entrance, Pelham Road entrance to Short Hills Provincial Park, which was the scene of the protest against the hunt and also us uh, supporting the Haudenosaunee hunters. And following the um, playing on this little um, PA system here, portable speaker that I brought in, Celeste Smith, who was one of the co-founders of the supporters of the Haudenosaunee Right to Hunt, gave a teaching on the two row, which brings us to the two row. And this was an exhibition curated by Marcy Bronson at Rodman Hall Art Center in 2016. There were three works connected with it. Uh, two digital prints and vinyl text on the window. You can't really see it, but it says the sun still sets in the west. And um, an artist garden. It was a summer of horrendous drought. I get a kick out of seeing this drone uh, picture that Jimmy Limit took because the garden has been so beautifully watered by the landscape um, stuff, but uh, the rest of the grass looks in a sorry state. And this was planted with purple and white alyssum. I have, uh, in order to make a living, worked uh, in the horticultural industry for much of my life and Niagara Nurseries, where I worked uh, seasonally for about 30 years, gave me greenhouse access. And I sowed about 8,000 seeds, which turned out to be not enough plants. We still had to buy more. And it was, the garden was planted in a planting day where we brought together youth uh, Haudenosaunee youth, settler youth uh, from families. I asked these girls who, where their ancestors came from and they did not know. 
and then very recently um, immigrated from the Middle East, actually, uh, um, these three uh, groups of youth together to plant the plants and um, a knowledge keeper gave uh, uh, teachings on the two road to them. And then walking the talk was a video that I made. This brings us to Treaty of Niagara, which is uh, part of power. And this image I will return to later also. Uh, channel two has this word right, and on channel one, it joins up with relationship. And whoops, and uh, we have a reading list on the Riverbrink website on the page about my show. And uh, the right relationship, reimagining the implementation of, the his of historical treaties. I haven't talked about why I work with treaties. There are two reasons. Uh, first of all, because the work is about place and in uh, what is, you know, used to be Upper Canada, where uh, we are here in Niagara or in the Maritimes. Pre-Confederation treaties are uh, uh, a critical aspect of history and of governance. And also I am a firm believer in the idea which um, you see reflected in this uh, title that the pre-Confederation treaties show us the way forward because at that time in history, there was much more, much greater acknowledgement on the part of the British Crown uh, to uh, Indigenous sovereignty. Next, we're going to look at briefly, I can see I'm running out of time already, embodiment. What does it mean to be in a body? So I'm going to whip through this section. Video is flat and two dimensional. So I use four strategies to inspire embodiment. The first one is the camera that I choose. I took up this strategy with Confluence field trips and a chest mounted um, GoPro. And then with Swallow, I was able to buy a DJI Osmo Plus. So I carry this on this handle and it has this marvelous stabilizer called a gimbal. So I am able to include my body's motion in the uh, video that I shoot. And I just wanted to make this little um, acknowledgement here of a work from 1993 where I strapped, uh, uh, this was back when there was still tape, a uh, high eight millimeter um, handicam to my back. So I have had this interest for a while. The second embodiment strategy is that the participants uh, walk and walking is a way to know place. By the way, you never see the three women like this in power. I just put these images together for the PowerPoint. Um, and a uh, brief mention of walking works. In 1992 to 97, I did a series of works where the performance audience walked on trails and paths. And I took up walking again in 2007 for um, a garden conference that Sherilyn Ingram and colleagues uh, uh, mounted at Rodman Hall uh, in 2007. I did sound and image walks for a couple of years uh, with that conference. And that was of course riffing on sound walks. So these two walk uh, images are from Confluence field trips. And I called it my Magnus Opus because there were a hundred people who participated and a total of 17 walks on three Confluence field trips, three different sites along Canal Valley. This is a walk from a symposium at, uh, connected with the Living River Project, that's by Detroit River. This is one of the walks uh, for daylighting, and you can see the audience is walking um, down this blue ribbon of light uh, towards the, um, the sound uh, in daylighting. And um, I meant to mention, I forgot that Lucius's garden, uh, I mentioned it took up the subject of infrastructure and it got me interested in sewers and daylighting refers to the practice, uh, which is all over the place of 
unearthing the buried creeks. Toronto is well known for its buried creeks, but there are buried bodies of water like that going back centuries in uh, certainly in Europe and other parts of, of the world. So in contemporary times, there are many places in the world where they're bringing their creeks that have been placed into pipes or are covered up to light and that's called daylighting. And this is walking the talk here again. So the third strategy I use is that uh, because of the nature of the cameras that I use occasionally, my body turns up and I make a point of not editing it or my shadow out of the shots in power. There's a number of examples of my shadow or of a um, couple examples of body parts. This of course is also an acknowledgement of my subjectivity and process. So this is kind of an old school conceptual uh, thing as well. And uh, strategy four. So spatialization, like Darren Copeland is uh, renowned uh, uh, in many places in the world as a spatialization um, uh, expert. And unlike composers who use um, uh, multiple channels of sound and spatialized sounds, I purposely avoid what a composer might choose as the sweet spot of uh, electronic concert sound because I ideally want um, viewers to, I want people to move through the space of the gallery. It was a bit frustrating with Swallow at um, uh, uh, Windsor because the room was so small, there wasn't really anywhere to move, but at Riverbrink there is. So I'm hoping that when you're in the gallery space, you will be physically drawn to sound and you'll hear a sound source that you might want to check out. Um, there's also um, bird sounds that sort of travel amongst the speakers. So uh, I, it's already almost half an hour. Deborah, are there any questions which before I zoom in on uh, power uh, that I should, um, that you would like to ask? Anybody's asked at this point? Uh, nothing yet. Okay, I'll keep going. Part two, we're now going to zoom in on the work itself. After giving you some kind of context. Oh, I want to talk about this, um, this graphic. Uh, so I designed this graphic. It's kind of a logo in a way for the work. Um, I'm always indebted to my daughter, who's a designer for City of Toronto for font advice. And this is Babis. And this wavy line, of course, represents the river and the three lines, the three women walking. And I want to tell you a bit about this rectangle. This is a map in the historical maps of Niagara um, at uh, the collection at Brock University Map Data and GIS Library. So here we have the river and this is Fort George. And I've made a little red doodle here around the Indian Council House. So this rectangle here is a representation of the Indian Council House. And uh, I probably forgot entirely to say that way back, um, oh, maybe I should not be going, oh, here. So in this slide, uh, this here is Fort Niagara, one of the sites of negotiation of, of Treaty of Niagara. And of course, I'm shooting from the Canadian side. So I'm shooting at what is now the American side and that's Fort Niagara. And on what's now the Canadian side, the Indian Council House was the site of negotiation. And Riverbrink just happens to have this uh, drawing in its collection. You can find it online. And this is, uh, I'm uh, not gonna take the time uh, with the artist in year, et cetera, but this was the former by the time this drawing was made of um, the Indian Council House, which by then was Hospital Niagara. So I asked the three walking women participants, what does the river mean to you? And what do you imagine it may have meant to your ancestors? I forgot to mention earlier that with confluence field trips and daylighting, 
The participants walked with a handheld Zoom audio recorder. And this, uh, the participants' words, uh, their own words form a very important part of the work. So with power, I had originally envisioned it as each um, woman uh, recruiting people from her community, but that got kiboshed because they didn't get the funding to pay them. COVID no doubt played a role in that as well. Um, I also forgot to mention earlier that, although it's mentioned in the description, the three women live in Niagara. I know them all. And they're here in Niagara because of uh, the displacement or movement of their ancestors when the boundary was border was created. I will be coming back to the subject of the boundary very soon. So what does the river mean to you and what do you imagine it may have meant to your ancestors? was the question that I asked them. Here we are with the boundary. So you look at Niagara River and you see, uh, don't see an invisible line. And if you Google Niagara River and Google Maps, this is what you get. And there's this line that goes into Lake Ontario, right down the river and into uh, the middle of Lake Erie. And to the west is Niagara Peninsula, Ontario, Canada, and to the east is New York State and uh, the United States. So this boundary um, means uh, different things to different people. And uh, one thing that it means, um, we're very, well, we're, not everybody is familiar, but many of us are familiar now with how disruptive the formation of the boundary between Canada and the United States that was formed uh, with the American Revolution uh, in Niagara, but of course um, uh, uh, formed piecemeal later as well, how it divided indigenous uh, communities. So uh, the Jay Treaty, which I'm not gonna get into, 1794 uh, provided the Haudenosaunee with the right for free crossing. And um, there's been a Haudenosaunee border crossing from Canada to the US every third Saturday in July since 1928. And it goes on to this day, it happened this year. And if you wanna find out more, you can uh, look up hashtag fight the line. And One Dish, One Mike podcast archive, uh, Carl Dockstader has, um, uh, of course, is a fantastic source for learning about this. If you'd like to know more about the Haudenosaunee displacement with the American Revolution, which happened, of course, because of um, uh, honoring the treaty, right? To The Haudenosaunee honored their treaty with the British crown. And uh, they were uh, then um, displaced from Mohawk Valley and their lands in what became the United States. I recommend The Clay We Are Made Of as a fantastic, I love this book, it's really great. It um, Haudenosaunee land tenure on the Grand River. So it's not addressing all the Haudenosaunee displacement, but certainly uh, the um, uh, displacement uh, to Grand River territory. Um, I discovered when I was making my PowerPoint that my um, PowerPoint has lost its functionality for hyperlinks and sound files. So we don't have a sound file, but here is a report from a document that I highlighted in uh, earlier. And this document appears in Swallow and Power. This is the cover, the report of the International Waterways Commission upon the international boundary between the Dominion of Canada and the United States through the St. Lawrence River and Great Lakes, 1915. So I talked about my early in this body of work uh, interest in numeric naming and how it fascinated me because it is representative of uh, uh, a colonial approach to water and land. So kind of get this, this is from this document. And I'm just gonna read aloud um, uh, a little bit. And it is one of the important sound sources. I think of it as a kind of drone uh, or basso continuo, although not technically uh, in the sound source. Latitude 43 degrees, zero four minutes, 45 decimal, 36 seconds north. 
Longitude 79 degrees 04 minutes 20 decimal 38 seconds west, then south 13 degrees 59 minutes 00 seconds east, 1,416 feet up the Horseshoe Falls to turning point number 138. So, uh, etc. So I used, um, uh, obviously I couldn't use the whole thing. You can imagine how long this is, right? Uh, I just think it's like so, uh, so wild this way of, um, uh, anyway, I will stop talking about it because I could go on. Um, now, important thing to mention, Vicki Lynn Smith, uh, who is one of the women participants, she is there because uh, her ancestor was a freedom seeker. Now, the important thing to mention here is that the Underground Railway took place quite a bit after uh, the Treaty of Niagara. And many of us have been under the uh, misconception that there was no slavery in Canada and that is dead wrong. And this is being addressed uh, uh, in contemporary times by scholars such as Charmaine uh, Nelson and um, uh, uh, artists um, as well as scholars. Uh, here are some sources uh, that you can uh, turn to uh, regarding that history. This is a little book which was published quite a while ago, 1993, first printing by the uh, Niagara Historical Society. It's still available and it's fabulous. Uh, to my knowledge, it was written by settlers, I believe, but uh, uh, I hope I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, uh, it addresses specifically slavery and freedom in Niagara. Now, river remediation, I'm gonna kind of skip through because there's a YouTube video where I talk for eight minutes about the images of river remediation in power. And uh, it's available on the Riverbrink uh, YouTube channel. And my remarks followed a wonderful talk given by Natalie Green, that project manager of the Niagara River Rep that I mentioned earlier. The talk was envisioned to be um, coincidental with the exhibition, but because of all the postponements that happened earlier. Now, the Niagara River is incredibly better than it used to be. It's a good news story, which is not to say there are not still issues. But that document that I briefly glossed over about the Great Lakes Agreement from 1978 identified areas of concern within the Great Lakes system. The Great Lakes holds 23% of the planet's fresh water. So this is not just about uh, people who live in Niagara. This is, this is really global. Uh, it's binational, but it's global. So the RAPs, as they're called, Remedial Action Plans, uh, responsible uh, for the um, improving the astounding level of pollution in, um, I can start getting carried away, I must stop. But I sat on the public advisory committee for the Niagara River RAP and I um, learned so much. I also just do wanna mention, I was so impressed with the level of collaboration uh, the intergovernmental collaboration, as well as the collaboration with uh, citizen scientists and uh, naturalist groups and such. It really is a, a good no news story and you can learn more by going to this website. So moving right along here to language. There are about 50 words in power. And these are just some um, layouts I did for Instagram. Uh, this one, uh, this, um, we actually saw that in the little video that um, uh, Deborah played at the outset. So uh, these would be side by side and uh, come up in sequence, the river returns to the river. And these images are shot uh, at the tail race of Sir Adam Beck too. And I mentioned in my thanks, uh, Ontario Power Generation. I had really wanted to shoot the tail race and because of COVID it was like uh, postponed, shall we say many times. And last November, uh, 
uh, Jennifer Grossi, uh, finally, I was able to get into Sir Adam back too. This is like deeply thrilling for me. And I was able to go down to the tail race and shoot video and record audio. So I uh, didn't mention, I'm not sure if we have an image coming up, we may not, but in the mid river section uh, with Marie, she is by a structure. Um, I didn't point it out in the, uh, in the image, an odd looking structure. And what that structure is part of is the tunnel, the Niagara tunnel that takes the river into the hydroelectric stations on both sides of the border. And diversion of the water of the river has been going on for like really a long time. Again, I must stop talking. I could get carried away with this subject. I find it really fascinating. Uh, the uh, link between industry and, uh, and nature in the area. So this is where the water comes out after producing the electric uh, power and uh, it's hotter and there's an effect um, on, uh, on fish. Here's a couple more. Uh, so I noticed river remediation, riparian restoration. This is language that I picked up at the get go when I started to get involved with the wraps. And of course the alliteration was attractive to me. And I started to realize that the language of um, river remediation and de decolonizing language, there is so much that is the same. There is so much that crosses both of these uh, burning contemporary issues. Uh, by the way, I avoided using the word reconciliation. It does not appear in power because I know the word has just taken on such a bad taste. It started to with um, Colton um, Bushy. This reimagine here is one of the animated titles. So imagine comes up and then it turns into reimagine. I'll uh, go over another one of those. Ah, here we are. So. Um, these three slides, it would be better if you could see it in video, but I started this uh, sequence with the uh, rights. And many of us are familiar that when we look at the um, legal jurisprudence, the difference between colonial European legal concepts and indigenous legal concepts, that uh, there's one of the uh, ways the primary uh, difference is often expressed is the difference between rights and responsibilities. So rights was turning into right, which then joined up with relationship. And then uh, while I was editing, I went back and uh, backed up to righteousness and I'm going to read you why. So this is from The Great Law of Peace by uh, Paul Williams. I'm reading uh, from just a little bit from it. The third word or principle of the peace is often translated into English as either power or righteousness. It is an imperfect translation. The concept can mean the power of peace. It is the power to get things done. John Mohawk explained, and this is quote, he promised them power not military power, but the power of righteousness. Where would this power of righteousness come from? In some societies, this is a negative idea because righteousness is often presumptive, unthinking, and uncaring. He defined righteousness as the result of the best thinking of collective minds, operating from principles which assume that a sane world requires that we provide a safe environment for our children seven generations into the future. So um, I, uh, by the way, this reminds me to mention that the title, Power, I am inviting the uh, audience to consider what that word means to them, what kinds of power uh, we operate under and in and exert uh, in the world that we live in. 
Uh, the last word that appears is remember. And uh, this, by the way, I mentioned Song for Blue Moon from 2004. It also happens to be the last word that's repeated in uh, the Eskinobidich song, uh, which was composed uh, by um, um, Wen Bartley. I commissioned her uh, to write the very beautiful music. And uh, because of the time, I will not, uh, but I would just ask that you consider what the word remember means in the context of uh, reimagining the uh, historical treaties or reimagining, redressing the, relation, the right relationship between Canada and Canadians and uh, Indigenous uh, uh, the peoples and nations. So lastly here, I wanna look at the gesture. So in power, there's a gesture. Um, so the movement of power, the video movement, the imagery moves from upstream to downstream. So like I said, you never see the three women on the screen at the same time because Janice Barlow, who has a United Empire Loyalist ancestor. She's walking upstream, that's the Lake Erie end, Fort Erie end. And then Marie uh, is in the mid river section near the Niagara Tunnel where the water goes into the power station. And um, Marie, uh, uh, very close ancestry comes from Grand River territory. And Vicki Lynn Smith, uh, her ancestor uh, was a freedom seeker. And Vicki Lynn is walking in the downstream section near to Lake Ontario. So there's no direct linked sequence um, in the sense that you don't see them reaching out to one another, but you do if you're paying attention sort of temporally. So Janice reaches out her hand and then uh, a bit later, Marie is reaching out her hand to meet um, Janice's hand, except Janice's hand isn't there anymore. And then Marie is the only one who holds out both arms because she's in mid river. And then Vicky Lynn extends her left arm towards um, uh, mid river where Marie has walked. So here's the source of this gesture, and this is the wampum belt of the Treaty of Niagara. And there's an important concept uh, to Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe uh, diplomacy with the pre-Confederation treaties about the covenant chain. And uh, there's this idea that when one side is forgetting its responsibilities or when one side needs help, you pull on the covenant chain to remind your treaty partner of their responsibilities and they will come to your age aid. Needless to say, this um, treaty has uh, responsibility has not been kept up by um, uh, the Crown or the government of Canada. And uh, also I wanted to mention that I do not expect people to come into the gallery and for very many people anyway, to look at this and say, aha, you're pulling the covenant chain. But I think that this gesture reads, uh, my background, my origins are in the discipline of dance. This open hand, this stretching out an outstretched arm uh, along this, uh, this flowing river, I think um, speaks uh, uh, pretty clearly and that is it. Great to see you all. Bye-bye.